So um, we want to introduce our next panel, um, uh, which is going to be led by uh, Tracy Powell. Stand in front of the camera. Um, and um, as we said earlier, and I, not everyone was in the room, um, you know, Lion has about 200 members. Um, INN has 150 members, something like that. We know of between the two of us and other unaffiliated local online news sites that there's about 600 of them that we know about in the U.S. And I think there could be more because there's ones that we don't, you know, we find every day that aren't necessarily going to journalism conferences and stuff like that. Um, and the question is, how many do we need to solve the local news desert crisis in this country? Um, and how do we get there? If that's a thousand, if that's two thousand, um, how is that? How is that going to emerge, or, or, or can it? Um, and a key factor in that is uh, startup capital and seed money. Most Lion members bootstrapped, right? They had uh, a retired, they had a severance check, or they had um, a spouse, <laughs> you know, um, that could help support them. Um, and that uh, makes for a very unequal emergence of local news sites from community to community or random, you know? And um, so uh, Tracy Powell and Wendy Thomas and Rebecca Monson are gonna dig into this question and I'd like to ask uh, that they give a little bit of background about themselves too to start. I mean, I don't know. I'm just guessing. It's not necessary. We don't really have to have the slides. Well, I can with this. Okay. So we'll introduce yourselves. So, good morning, everybody. I'm Tracy Powell. I am the founder of All Digitocracy, but I'm also on the board of directors for, for Lion. And I'm really happy um, to welcome you today. Not, not just two women who are. Um, Friends of mine, but my, you know, two of my personal superheroes. Um, a little bit about um, a little bit about myself. I started a site called All Digitocracy. It focused on diversity and, it, and its impact on diverse communities. It's turned into kind, into kind of a more of a consulting firm now than a website, and, and a lot of that has to do with, um, quite frankly, funding. Um, how diff the difficulty of of raising money um, to support to support the kind of work that I was doing. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But first, I want to make sure I want you to meet two of my two of my friends, um, Wendy Thomas and Rebecca Monson. And um, if you could talk a little bit um, about yourselves, but more importantly, your work um, in the audiences that you reach. Um, Hi. That mic this one? The other one? Yes, we will. We will pass it around. Um, hey, I'm Rebecca Monson. I've met some of you guys before. Um, I uh, founded, a co-founded a company called Where By Us, and we do local media, a lot of coverage on um, arts, culture, and neighborhood stuff. A lot less. We're not doing investigative stuff right now. Not our, not our, uh, not our bailiwick. Uh, but hopefully one day we'll get there. Um, but we started as a way to sort of, as a company designed to sort of. Um, filling gaps in local media ecosystems in um, cities where there are a lot of millennials moving in. So we're right now in Orlando, Portland, um, Miami, and Seattle. And um, we just launched Orlando and Portland uh, a couple months ago, and Katie is uh, in the back there. She's our Orlando director, so I wanted her to meet some of you guys um, since you've been all battle-hardened uh, in the local news ecosystem. Um, but we uh, we started as a sort of we started just as like a meetup group, um, not a media company at all. So me and my friend Chris and Bruce, uh, we were doing like these little meetups um, to get a bunch of like nerds together to brain uh, do design thinking around city challenges, and um, to sort of build small scale solutions to big problems and sort of try to get people active. Miami is where we started, and Miami is like 
one of the least civically engaged cities in every single sort of study that comes out about this. Um, we've gotten a lot better in recent years, but at this point in time, it was like the lowest of all major metros. So um, we started doing this kind of work and we kept hearing this gap um, for this core audience of people who were obviously interested in the city, wanted to be engaged, but they didn't have the same kind of media habits that we would expect, right? They're not subscribing to the paper, they're not reading news websites, they're definitely not watching local news. Basically, all their media is time shifted uh, or aggregated through some other platform. So we set out to sort of research this and, and eventually sort of built a business model around it and have now built um, a, a media company around it with newsletters kind of at the center of that. Um, so that's where we are right now. We have, um, we are on track uh, we're, we're making pretty good money. We got break even at the New Tropic uh, in the first year. We're now uh, projecting to get each city break even in six months. Um, so, and we're on track to do that. Um, the key there is that we start with extraordinarily small teams, like one person teams, and, and then we layer on as we start um, earning money. Um, but I'm really eager to hear about your funding challenges and talk to you guys about different kind of ways we've looked at funding problems. Um, and it's very different for every different company, right? Like every 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 one of our babies is special and, <laughs> and different and unique. And so the funding behind them is gonna be very different. But I'm really excited to chat with y'all today. Um, again, Wendy Thomas, I'm the editor and publisher of MLK50 at MLK50.com. Um, it was designed as, or it is designed as a one-year project based in Memphis, and it's time to the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination. That's the name. Um, I'm a longtime journalist um, in Memphis and Charlotte, Nashville, and Annapolis. Um, and this project I incubated during my NEMA year in 2015-2016. Um, you know, like most cities, the media landscape is uh, shrinking. The Daily Paper, where I was uh, Amy in Commons for 11 years, um, is a, a shadow of its prior self, so there was really um, a void of substantive reporting into the kind of issues that brought King to Memphis in 1968, so jobs and wages, um, uh, inequality, poverty. Um, today, the Memphis metro area is the poorest large metro in the nation, and the um, poverty rate for black children in um, Memphis is nearly 50%, and that's the highest in the country, so um, more than Detroit, Newark, name your city that you kind of think of is really poor and Memphis is worse. Um, and so uh, we launched April 4th, appropriately, 2017. Um, and over the course of the year, my team of contributors, uh, photographers, writers, editors, uh, produced uh, more than 200 stories. We grew from a you know Twitter, social media following of virtually none. And I was trying to calculate just now the percentage growth and it's, you know, in the tens of thousands in terms of like um, from the beginning uh, to the end. Um, right before the 50th anniversary, um, April 4th of uh, this past, this year, um, I think on Twitter in two days we had like um, 1.6 million impressions, which is a lot for a, for a start, a startup organization. And perhaps most importantly, you know, the, the conversation we had around jobs and wages, particularly living wage jobs, forcing that issue into the um, public consciousness. Um, I, we can't take complete credit for that, but after a big series we did about um, which employers, which large employers paid their workers enough to live on, um, both the um, city of Memphis and the um, public school system announced that they were going to raise the wages of their employees to at least $15 an hour. And we feel like we had, a, we played a large part in um, pushing a community toward that. So it's really gratifying to know that your work like helps materially change the quality of lives for thousands um, of workers in, in Memphis. Um, this was a completely bootstrap uh, project. Um, we got some decent money and I, we can talk a little bit more about that um, later. And one of our commitments in our project was to pay all of our contributors at least $15 an hour. And lots of them were um, paid a lot more than that, because we didn't want to replicate economic um, injustice in a project about economic injustice, because that's just like beyond um, 
be ironic. So, yeah. Thank you so much. So, so now that you've heard a little bit about our audiences, um, just by show of hands, how many people in here are founders, and how many are people thinking about being founders? Ooh. So, everybody, most of the founders. Anybody thinking about it? Any funders? <laughs> Okay, all right, so no, I would to tailor our discussion today. Um, I do want to hear a little bit more about um, how your organizations were financed. We can talk a little, we can talk a little bit about the challenges, but two of you are basically exceptions to the challenge. So, um, Wendy, talk to me a little bit about, a little bit more about bootstrapping and um, how you, you know, what your challenges and and how you were able to overcome them. Um, all right, so I spent um, my Neiman year incubating this and trying to figure out how would I make it work. And so I took a class in social entrepreneurship at the Kennedy School where we had to come up with a business plan, identify our competitors, you know, the whole thing you do when you're doing a business plan. Um, and my uh, professor told me it, it wasn't possible. Like what I was proposing could not be done. Um, and Based in part on that feedback, for one, I did do what he said I couldn't do, because, and I was glad to be able to email him to say, <laughs> remember when you said I could? I did. Um, but it's why I decided to make it a year-long project and not an, an ongoing um, news uh, outlet, although that may change, um, because this kind of journalism is really expensive, particularly if you're going to pay your workers fairly. Um, and so, like maybe the year between. Um, so I, the time I left the fellowship and I actually launched, um, you know, I was working on that almost full time, but making really no money. So um, when I think about the barriers to doing this kind of work, I, you know, I don't come from money necessarily, but um, definitely not poor. And over the years of working in decent journalism jobs, I had really good credit. So I basically lived off credit cards um, for a year, but a lot of people don't have that. And so I realized that I'm incredibly privileged to even it. Um, have had available credit to do that. Uh, once we started raising money, well, if I could, had to do it over again, I would have raised a lot more money before we started. I would have really, really pushed to do that more. Um, but I don't think I was, without having something to show, I maybe wasn't as confident in going and talking to people. But then once you have something to show, you need to be doing, spending a lot of time creating more content to show, which reduces the time you have for um, fundraising. So the fundraising was mainly just me. Um, we got a hundred thousand dollars from Servna Foundation, um, which was transformative. And over the total course of the project, raised about two hundred twenty-five thousand um, dollars. A few of the, uh, you know, a ten thousand grant here, some support from the Center of Community Change in DC in terms of like an ongoing stipend for um, to have kind of like a fellow. Uh, but a lot of it was just a thousand dollars here. I remember I had three friends that wrote me a um, thousand dollar checks early on, and I can remember how nervous I was to ask anybody for anything. And now I have no <laughs> problem you know, um, doing that. Rebecca, before I go to you, um, like any good journalist, I asked my panelists questions before we got here. So, Wendy, one of the things that you said about um, um, your bootstrapping is that. Um, Low-income and middle-class um, members of your audience um, don't necessarily or can't support a new startup, um, and you know, for the most part, I found out that was that is true as well. So, in the age when we hear about certain other startups um, receiving millions of dollars, for uh, one successful local startup is in Mississippi today, and then one of our one of our members. Um, and they benefited from um, white men who gave them millions of dollars. Is that the business model? I think it certainly helps um, <laughs> to have that kind of a runway um, going in. I just read it may be that um, DIY for starting up your own um, news site that's been going around like in the last week um, that talked about Mississippi Today, which I think is doing good work going from idea to launch in 10 months. Well, you can do that when you have Andy Lack, um, head of NBC, promising you a million dollars that they'll give or get over a certain number of years. Um, but when you're starting a project with literally not a dime in a bank, but 
lots of thousands of dollars of credit card debt on the part of the founder. It's just a really, really different um, dynamic. And when I was incubating the project, I interviewed a lot of startup news founders, and um, they had a couple things in common. All of them, the word had some kind of staying power. They were started by white men, and they got uh, seven-figure donations from um, a single person or couple. So ProPublica, Marshall Project, um, Mississippi Today. Uh, and I think that's critical when we think about what will the, the landscape look like going forward. And unless um, uh, people of color and women are given that same kind of runway, I, don't, I think it's going to be difficult to see any kind of equity because we're just not starting from the same, same place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Rebecca, um, as one of my closest friends, <laughs> Um, white women are doing a little bit better. Oh yeah. Um, Look, the privilege, the privilege pays. I mean, it sucks. Not, but not a whole lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and I have two white men founders. Like, you know, like my co-founders are both white guys. And uh, and I mean, th this is a real thing. Like, the inequity in found in in funding is is a real problem. Not just in media, but across technology and pretty much in every other industry. And and um, I. Uh, I commend you because the the whole credit card debt like pay like I did we did that the first year like we did not have a huge amount of money to start the business uh, but it was enough to get us going and to give us the confidence that we could like be more ambitious in our planning and that's really why you're going after that initial fundraising so the way we started the company we actually started with a little grant project that was about research it was a it was for a local community foundation and. We basically, um, we were like, hey, you guys have a problem with millennial engagement in the city. And like, we're, we've been working on this. We have a little track record of stuff to show. And it was like, we want to research this problem for you. We'll give you all the stuff, right? So we did that work. Um, that was like nights and weekends for a good seven or eight months um, while I was working at UM and everybody had their other jobs. And then we basically used that research to build our business plan out of it, which sounds a lot like what you were kind of doing, like, uh, you know, trying to understand the landscape, figure out how people got from point A to point B, and then understand the users and the need really well. So after that, um, we we started doing this, you know, just starting to build the thing, because we knew at that point what we wanted to build, we made a business plan, we did all that, and um, started pitching it, um, got a an investment, um, but the investment that we got was not because of the media work. It was because we wanted to build a tech platform to solve a local media challenge, right? Um, and that's still a huge part of our mission. Like the journalism is an important and meaningful and like deeply, it's the, at the center of everything we do. But there's also this idea of like what we actually want to build is some scalable systems so that people like us can start local media projects that have newsletters at the center of them and a membership model and all these things a lot more easily and efficiently and, and quickly. And so our initial investment was about that for part of the proposal, not about journalism and content. And that's a, that's a tough thing too. Like if you're going after money, it's really hard to find people who are like, I love your, uh, your plan to build this amazing vehicle for new content in our community, uh, but we don't, you're going to hear like we don't fund content projects a lot. Right. Yeah. Um, thanks for bringing that up because a lot of funders do say we don't want to fund content. So, but Rebecca was over was ever over, was able to overcome that by approaching people like at the Knight Foundation. Can we let's talk a little bit about the complexity sure. of the landscape when it comes to funding? Yeah. So we got a, our initial investment was a venture investment from Knight's Venture Fund, which is now kind of like nascent. Um, I think they're doing follow-ons, but they're not doing new investment out of that. Ben Wurz used to run that, so I don't know what the deal is with that. I'm sure there are Knight Foundation people here who can correct me if I got that wrong. Um, but uh, that was like our initial thing, and and uh, but but um, I think if we had not gotten that, we would have gone after community foundation grant funding that we could do that was um, that was more content focused. Probably like we wouldn't have been making a platform pitch, right? We would have been making a much more like community oriented pitch. And it sounds like some of the there's there's a bunch of there are dollars there, right? Like there's. There's um, foundations, local foundations, there's corporate social responsibility arms who really want to like back projects like this, and you have to be really careful about who you get involved with on that side. 
Um, but there's like a whole slew of people in individual local markets who do want to fund this work. And it's about making sure that the work you want to do, you can tell the story about how it aligns to their vision. Learning how to do that from a journalist perspective feels like you're learning how to be a bullshit artist, and it's hard, right? Because you're not actually, like you're not, you're not lying to anyone about why you want their money. But the, the truth is I think that we are socialized through our educations and whatever to, to not, to be afraid to ask people for not things. Not be self-promoting. Yeah, to not be self-promoting, that's exactly right. And if you're a woman or a person of color, you can multiply that you know, times a whole lot more. Um, but maybe you, you probably have some better perspective about that, about like telling your story so that it appeals to funders in, in the right ways, or like targeting it for the right kind of funder. Yeah, I think with the um, anniversary of King's death coming came uh, approaching, we had this sense of urgency. So it was like, you have to give us this money now. If you're going to support it, we can't have a conversation in six months. Um, so that, I think, was, was useful. Um, we didn't establish ourselves as our own nonprofit. We used a fiscal agent that does a lot of neighborhood community work, and so that was an end to the Sergeant of Foundation. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had it. Um, also, being, you know, starting out as a project, you know, a lot of places don't want to fund things that aren't going to be, you know, around, you know, forever. So we got some money from um, FedEx before we started the reporting because actually FedEx is one of the, is the largest employer in town. It doesn't pay workers enough to live on doesn't pay a living wage. And so once we started writing the stories that we were doing, which were um, you know, disruptive um, and, and challenging of the status quo, as King was, right? So in the same being true to the, the content, um, it got increasingly difficult to raise money because the people who usually have the money are people who profit from the status quo. That's how they've made their money. And so there's this kind of essential tension there um, we had some progressive people that gave us money. One of the local community foundations um, gave us ten thousand dollars, but it was these kind of drips and, and drabs, and it was it really think outside the box. Yeah, and creative yeah. in terms of who your funding partners yeah. might be. Now I posted a list, and I can't I can't figure out how to blow it up, but mm -hmm. I posted a list of, of funders: um, New Media Ventures, Knight. Um, and there's there are just several um, potential sources for funding for this type of work. Um, also, Lion has a new program called Ramp, in which we mentor um, new um, publishers and help them figure out how to bring in revenue to support to support the work. So that's one way we're trying to work around the, how funders um, the, the idea of not funding content. Um, we can help. We can. Um, they may not be able to do it directly, but we're able to through Lion to help in some in certain several ways. We, Provided grants and so forth, so that's 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 one way to get around it. But I, you know, maybe we can also talk with the audience about ideas to help reframe funders when it comes to how they think about funding this work. Um, can we talk a little bit about before we? I want to talk about new deserts, but before we get into that, I want to talk about for profit and nonprofit. What are the differences and why you chose to go the way you went? Uh, I will talk about it first. We are for profit. We're um, we wanted that from the outset, in part because it means that you have fewer restrictions on how you raise money and and how you earn money and what you do with it. Um, so part of it was we wanted to build. I, I don't think that that model necessarily works for like a project, right? Like it's really hard. I, I I'm trying to conceive of the business plan for a project to be a for profit. It doesn't quite make sense to me. I'm sure somebody in here is probably a genius and can figure it out. But for us, it was about, we don't know, this is where we want to start this business and this is how we think we're going to grow it. Um, but over time, we're going to learn a lot of stuff and we want to be able to pivot and move um, in specific ways without necessarily, you know, the, one of the big problems I think with taking lar particularly large grant funding kind of things is that there are, there's an outcome that's expected, like with that money. And if you decide midway through or you learn, most funders are like, cool, you learned something, like, let's do what you need to do, right? But, um, but there is a, there's, a, there's a sort of set of hoops that you have to jump through to, like, make those turns um, that is different um, than when you're a for-profit business. Um, the other thing is the business plans look really different. Um, when you're doing a nonprofit, like, you're looking to, if you're not doing something that you want to last forever, um, which 
I honestly, I think we should be funding more projects like that because I think that we're going to discover a lot more models that make sense financially um, to do one off, like shorter term sort of things like pop ups almost. Um, but I'm not a funder, so. Uh, but but the thing that I think is interesting is like when you're building, it, it's like the business plan is about balancing the books, showing sustainability, proving that you're not going to necessarily be coming back to the same people with your handout every year. Um, I think that's a huge challenge that nonprofits face um, because you have to build you have to build like your revenue tiers, you know, just like a for profit would. Um, but the the calculus is a lot different. For profits, there's just like fewer restrictions on how you do that work. Um, yeah, I think if I if we were in a city that had a little bit more wealth, um, a for profit model might have worked. Um, and again, when I was incubating it through that social. Uh, Social entrepreneurship. There were people who were working um, at social entrepreneurship class. There were people that were working on for-profit models for not new necessarily, but other kind of social ventures. Um, you know, for the time that we were going to do it, it was kind of like a beta test. Can we do this? And if it works, then we can think about doing it um, again or continuing it, making it a, a freestanding thing. Um, I think for us, nonprofit probably was the right decision because the people who were inclined to support this. You know, probably also want the tax break. You know, to, yeah. to be to be honest, um, they want to feel like they're doing some kind of public good, and so the nonprofit model, you know, fits with that. And we did have a lot of, you know, um, we didn't call it formally members, but people who were recurring donors right. who gave a certain amount um, every month. And so it was good to know you had that guaranteed revenue coming in. And if we continue, we'll have to um, definitely, definitely uh, expand that and. You know, get some specific numbers on how many members we think we could have at what level. Um, and the foundation that gave us our most money wants to give us more money. Um, That's to, a good problem. It is a good problem. <laughs> when I say, like, we have money to spend, would you like it? You're like, hell oh, yeah, I'd like it. Like, <laughs> that would be great. So um, if we continue, we're going to pivot to just um, explanatory and investigative journalism. So the kind of longer form stuff we weren't able to get to in the course of covering a year and the events and kind of the movement in the moment. Um, but the same kind of topics, jobs and wages and poverty and inequality, um, and particularly how that intersects with power and public policy. So that would be the, the goal going forward if we are able to pull it off. Thank you. Um, show of hands, how one, many? Oh. One more thought about that. I do think the nature of the work you're trying to do also pays a huge role in whether you choose to be nonprofit or for-profit. I think if you are trying to do deeply explanatory investigative work, it, it is in some ways helpful to be a nonprofit because you are kind of, there There are a certain amount of like page view kind of driven like metrics and stuff that if you are collecting money from investors or whatever, those are metrics of success, whether you want them to be or not, um, not just impact. Like it's really hard to make that argument with someone who's looking to like 10x their money that no, but this is like we we change policy. Like they're they're like yeah, but how am I going to get my money out of it, right? Um, so there's a different there's a different like way of thinking about the work you're doing too that you have to factor in early. And it limits your advertising pool if you're um, microphone. Yeah. It, it limits your advertising pool. I think if if you're trying to avoid conflicts of interest about groups you're reporting about, but then they're also advertising on your sites. So I think it's a a tricky thing to balance. I'm showing hands. How many for profits? Three. Three. Four. Three. How many nonprofits? Okay. All right. Um, turn the conversation a little bit. I want to make sure I leave enough time for questions. Um, news deserts. Wendy has said that. Um, you know, I showed you this. Well, this map up here. This heat map. This is the map that CJIR published a few months ago, showing all the news deserts in the country. Since then, since this map came out in 2017, um, CJIR has acknowledged that the problem is worse than what this map depicts. Um, Wendy, you've said that the South is slipping away, um, that there just aren't enough um, local, local news sources that provide quality and information. Um, what do we do to create more startups like We're By Us and like MLK 50 to address this need? Yeah, so I think it, I mean, it comes back to the, the point of this uh, 
this panel, which is funding. Um, there's actually a group in Memphis that's starting. Um, it's going to spin off the daily news, what we're told. I don't have like documents that I could actually write this, but I've heard it from enough sources that I think it's pretty reliable. Um, the Daily News there is going to spin off um, into a nonprofit journalism outlet, and they've just hired away uh, three of the top talent um, from the Commercial Appeal, which is the daily paper in Memphis, um, which again is shrinking them down now to two photographers for the entire paper, which is so sad. Um, and so definitely there's um, a need and an appetite there, and this new nonprofit um, actually tried to buy the Commercial Appeal from Gannett, but not surprisingly, Gannett wasn't going to. So they, uh, they would never do that. Um, but uh, there's definitely opportunities there. Um, the Daily News, though, doesn't have a reputation of hiring women or people of color. Actually, has no women journalists or people of color journalists on its staff. And the three hires they just made were all white people. So I'm hoping that, that the content they produce will be more reflective of the community and the staff will as well. Um, so I'm still crossing my fingers for that. And I, I don't see them necessarily as um, competition because the kind of uh, work they've done in the past has not been the kind of work that my team does. Um, and so that's a good thing, but there aren't a lot of, Mississippi Today is very, that's a very hopeful project. Mississippi Today has a black editor and, chief, a, black and editor, a black yeah. managing editor. Yes, and that's in the last month, I think. Um, and so that's encouraging um, as well, but I think there's a lot more room. The, the traditional black paper. They're both men also, by the way. Well, that's Men are, men are cool too. They're, they're, they are cool. I just wanted to make yeah. a note. Yeah. Um, but I think just kind of across the South more broadly, there, there's not the momentum, of course, that you would see on an east, on the coast, um, and that's yeah, unfortunate. I'll get right right quick. Let me just ask her because Rebecca made an important point. Uh, we were talking earlier, and um, the perception is that there are, I mean, some very good. Nonprofit news organizations out there that, in, that get foundation funding, that's all they get. Um, ProPublica was one of the ones mentioned. But there is a perception that they take up all the air in the room, and that these very little space, if any, or smaller um, organizations like yours to produce and provide um, news for these underserved communities. Is that true? <laughs> and then it's, a, it's a good question. I, I think um, I think it's partially true. Like the people who are getting like large amounts of funding, they've been at this game a lot longer, and they have you know when you when the when the when the rock starts rolling downhill, right? It becomes it suddenly becomes a lot easier to raise money when you have a track record of success, right? So no, there is no I begrudge no one their ability to do that because it means hey, you're, you're fulfilling goals and like you're making impact. And I'm also like very heartened to see organizations like ProPublica um, and even more traditional like media companies doing a lot more collaborative work. I think that that's really important. Um, and I think there's an awareness um, about how important that is, particularly looking at this map. Um, you know, uh, the reason, there's a whole bunch of reasons behind news, desert, do, news deserts, but there's a whole, uh, like the math is the main one, right? Like communities are often underserved because there's not people out pounding the pavement to like, you know, to tell those stories in the first place. And so it just becomes like this cycle of, of like ignoring it. And also population, right? The South has a problem. I grew up in Alabama in the, you know, very rural part of Alabama. And, um, you know, the population of the place where I grew up, I'm not sure would totally sustain, um, you know, a, a, a for-profit organization, um, but it could be part of a regional sort of coverage network and things like that. And and we've seen the big media companies like withdraw, like their little map, their coverage map is getting smaller and smaller. So in some ways, that's awesome news for us because that means there's opportunity, right? And if you're not trying to make a venture scale business, you can make great lifestyle media businesses in communities that are relatively like small and like, you know, Gannett's not going to come after them, right? Um, so it's a mix, right? It is a mix. There is an, 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 an inequity there. Um, I also think that the better 
like the more you can prove success, um, the easier and easier it gets to be part of those conversations or to like build great collaborations where maybe you're not doing the fundraising or getting the money directly, but you're somehow getting resource. Um, and I'm excited to see a lot of projects sprouting up about that right now. So uh, real quickly, I think you said an opportunity, right? Yeah. I look at this, this is an opportunity oh map. Uh, oh, sorry. For the folks in TV land, hi. Uh, this is an opportunity map, right? Because I'm looking at it, and you're telling me that these are, these are the news deserts. So I, and so especially as a for-profit guy, I'm not thinking, well, how can I go and make business, make money here? Um, but for those of us who are unfamiliar with this map, are, are the dark, uh, shaded sections the most served or the most underserved? Uh, just a cursory look at counties. Yeah. Uh, it, are the white the are the dark, white out counties underserved? The, the, most underserved. the darker yeah. counties are the most, most underserved. underserved. Yeah, okay, right. well, thank again, you. That's, this is, you know, CJR is not Very helpful, Matt. Thank, thank you. I think, uh, yeah, I, I mean, the, the this funding and inequality thing is not gonna. It's not gonna be something like we live in a capitalist <laughs> country. Like, it's not gonna be something where I think it's like. Um, going to be solved solely just by the people's goodwill. It means like people like us, everybody in this room, has to continue hustling, and we have to tell each other's stories better. Not just our own stories, but stories like of everyone in this room, so that we can show funders and 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 Lion has been a great convener to make that argument on a grander scale. Because if someone funds Lion and Lion's, you know, sort of giving us all training and resource and all these things, it means that we all. Can benefit and and we have a, a, sh a shot at a bigger piece of the pie. Um, partnerships just are definitely key, and also um, there are a handful of um, universities now producing community news because the new, the daily news organizations in their communities have contracted so much. I, when I I think of University of Florida, I think of Texas Christian University, West Virginia University. They are now in the news business. Um, so I have one other area I want to get to, but I also want to ask, are there any additional questions? Sure. It's kind of a, a comment, too, and I brought this up to Matt, but um, I'm in the process of fundraising for a nonprofit, and, uh, you know, all of the foundations that I talk to and the potential individual donors, but, you know, many of course are looking for for data points, they're looking for, for uh, stuff that I can show them about how it can be successful or beneficial to a community, and, and I hear a lot of very good anecdotes, and they, they cert there certainly is evidence out there of, of success, but it would be helpful if, if INN and LION can bring that all together and compile some of this information and, and give it to us so that we can immediately go to a foundation and say, look, here's what happens with nonprofit journalism and how it can benefit your community. And, you know, I, it takes a lot of time to be able to compile that into a, you know, a cogent argument that, that helps us, but I think that would be something that would really be beneficial that, that I would appreciate and I don't think anyone else would feel that way. I also would just want to piggyback off your comment about technology and that I have found that, um, you know, that I'm, I'm getting some interest if I, if I paint our project as sort of a technology project. There are some technology funders that say, hmm, if I say, look, you have an opportunity to do some very progressive things as it pertains to journalism and communication and that we're not wedded to a platform and maybe you can help us, uh, you know, begin to tell our stories in a different way. And I just wanted to make that comment and, and you know, you, you mentioned that and I think that's, a, that's an interesting way to approach fundraising. Yeah, I mean, we're in this golden age where every company is a tech company and every company is a media company. Um, and in some ways, like, that is a that is to our benefit because you know what we're really good at? Storytelling. You know what tech companies often suck at? Storytelling. Yeah. So there's a, there's a whole thing, there's a whole thing to be done there if we can make those connections for people and help people understand why the technology is important and the content is also important and, when, and we are the right people to marry those things together. So can I ask you guys to address more specifically and simply, if I'm starting a nonprofit, I have zero dollars that I can commit to my 
bootstrapping myself, how do I get money to start this up? If I'm a for-profit, same question. And the answer for the for-profit might be not a good answer, I think. But like, yeah, I mean, the first, the first, if you have zero dollars, I'm not from, my parents are public school teachers, I don't have like generational wealth like back me up forever or anything like that. But I think the, the, the secret of this is not really a secret. Like the main equity that you have at the beginning is sweat. Like almost always. Like so that that is the equity that you put in, whether you're for profit or a nonprofit. If you're doing my suggestion is always to start smaller, like bootstrap some little piece of what you're trying to do so that you can show a result. So that I can give you like a so I can show you a win, right? Like I can take the thing that I made that was awesome. For us, it was like these little meetups where we were getting hundreds of like weirdo millennial nerds together to talk about cities, right? When I go to funders with that, like that, that was a compelling enough thing that I could get like the little bit of money to get us started. Um, but I think it's also like, you know, fundraising is about your network and your track record. And you, you have to be able to paint that picture for people of like, this is what I've done over here. And here's how it relates to what's next. Um, funders and investors and all of those people know that what you are telling them is the thing that you are going to build. Um, but they're looking for a track record. So to me, it's like, it's what is your track record and like what is the best narrative that you can spin it forward with, um, you know, and the results. Like what are the numbers, right? But can you, just, sorry, on the for-profit side, can you just address whether there are even investors who are interested in a content-based local news site? Very, that, very, very few. Um, or is it your father-in-law that you're going after? Yeah. Or friend? Or, I mean, I, I'm just... Yeah, I mean, look, the the truth the truth is, a, an investor in a for a, a for profit business is looking for a return on their investment. They want to see that you have like a very a strong business model, a strong plan to grow a business and to return multiples of the money that they put in. So that is a really if you are making a pure um, tech a, a pure content play. Right, it's really hard to make that argument when you look at where digital ad sales are, and and when you look at like the money right now, it's hard to make that argument unless you have some different way to monetize. So a lot of people are doing this on like events as a platform, or you know other things besides the content itself, because co we live in this time where content is incredibly commoditized, and you guys know the value of quality, um, but when you, uh, it's really hard to put that on a balance sheet for people, right? So um, I don't, when we started our company, we didn't start it as like, we're gonna build a for-profit media company. It was like, we wanna solve this little problem, let's see what happens. And it started as a nonprofit, and it started as like grant funded, like little projects that eventually became, okay, there's actually a business model here for something for-profit, because there's people all over the country and the world trying to solve this set of problems and if we could help them build the right tools or if we could build the right tools and build the brands around it, then there's money there. What is your thought about that? Um, well, and this really quickly on the um, money, I don't know how granular you were speaking, but I asked friends to throw me um, receptions yeah. in their house, right? And would say, hey, I'm hoping to raise $5,000 tonight. Can you help make that happen? Um, I went to Friends, I mean, I did not like doing this, right? Because as journalists, we don't we don't cross that line. We don't give to campaigns. We don't raise. We don't fundraise for people. So raising money for this project, knowing that Tumble was going to go to pay me, just felt it was weird. It was not a comfortable thing to do. Um, I literally made a list of all my relatives that I thought could give a thousand dollars or more, and I called them and asked them. You know, I've never asked these people for money before. I told my mom, "This is what I want for Christmas. I want you to make a donation." Um, to this project. Um, we had fun Facebook fundraising campaigns. We got an advanced screening of Black Panther um, and we were able to sell out two theaters like that. And it was just, everybody came dressed as, you know, King Zamunda from, you know, coming to America. It was wildly successful. People loved it. Now, Black Panther is like a once in, you know, whatever. So, so it's not going to be replicable every year. Um, yeah, we would just like beat the bushes. You have to find your biggest champions, your biggest cheerleaders, and um, they're more than likely going to help you out because they want to see you succeed, but, but also because they really believe in what you're doing. 
Uh, and I know Alba Tocracy was able to leverage a lot of that. So I think we have two questions in the audience. <laughs> I got a few comments, Joe. I've seen a lot. On the profit side, for profit side, I view my advertisers as my investors, okay? That way I'm not trading equity for someone to throw up a bunch of money. If I can build, like you're saying, you bootstrap the thing, you start with an inviolable product, and you can build an audience, and you can sell the dream. you got to be able to sell the dream. You can't sell it. You can't say i got millions of people. That's how you get started. The other thing is to uh, finance my operation, which is a for-profit news organization. We were professional services. We sold professional services, web development, marketing services. We put together email campaigns for people, that kind of thing. We don't do that much anymore. Probably should have kept doing it, but uh, but the advertising kind of you know, started flowing in, so we did well. But sell professional services and view your advertisers or your sponsors as investing in what you're doing and don't trade the equity. Thanks for bringing that up. All digitocracy produced webinars for a, couple, a few clients, and we were able to bring in money that way, too. Hi. Um, I apologize if I may have missed this part um, at the very beginning. I was wondering, um, you all talked a lot about asking for money and compensation. How does that work as far as your day-to-day? -day? I know you mentioned, uh, Wendy, that you lived off credit at different points. Like, how do you build in, do you get to build in like a salary for yourself? Like, how do you actually live to do these projects? And then the second question I had is, what are you all's thoughts about, I mean, we talked briefly about collaboration, like uh, having these type of collaborations with, say, ethnic media or specialized media like LGBTQ media to kind of have that workforce and that support of these type of projects. Yeah, so the first thing is tough, right? Um, you have to you have to pay yourself or it's not a business, it's a hobby, okay? So um, whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit, like if you can't eat and pay your rent or whatever, like it's, it's not actually a business and that's okay. Um, but the thing that I think is also true is that founders eat last. Um, so, you know, when it, when it comes to like our team, like if, if for some reason we lose a big contract and we're gonna have to cut, you know, cut things or whatever, like my, my salary is usually the first one to get cut or there, you know, there's, there's stuff like that. And that's, you know, that's because you're invested in this thing as like your livelihood and your business. And it's, it's you know, that's entrepreneurship. Um, but I do think you, you have to start being an advocate to like pay yourself something. I'm making probably, I don't know how much I'm making market compared to what I would make on the market, but I know it's not, it's like not a lot, a lot right? It's, it's like less than I was making when I left journalism, uh, to go to graduate school. So, um, which is fine, right? Because this is about building something that is for me long standing, and that's like the best job I've ever had too. So I can make ends meet and who cares, but, um, but yeah, you got to do that work, and then uh, I'll let you. Yeah. I do have a spouse. I have a spouse who um, I have a spouse who. We, when we started the company, she also she does commercial real estate, but she went on full commission at the same time as we started the company. So it was a couple of real lean years for us there, but you know we made it work. Um, and um, and there was you know we did a cruise in debt right uh, just to to make that happen. Um, what you said about founders eating last, that, oh, is so true. Um, so yes, I had a salary in the budget for me, um, but when you're starting and you literally had no money, I'm trying to pay my contributors and I'm trying to pay, pay them fairly. And so my thinking, which I would not do again, bad idea, um, was that after the project was ended, I would, I would pay myself what was left. That was a bad idea for a few reasons. There's um, never anything left. One, there was not enough <laughs> left. Um, Two, not paying yourself reg regularly, it's, not, it's just not bad for, it's bad for you financially, right? So like right now, I have a house, but if I, had, if I wanted to move, I probably couldn't because no one's gonna rent to me because I don't have regular income. Do you know what I mean? It looks, it looks crazy. Um, so yeah, I still have credit card debt. I think I went into, I think I generated maybe like 35,000 of debt, which is more debt than I've ever had probably in like in my entire life combined. I don't have a spouse, um, so I'm the only, it's just me. Um, I've managed to pay off about 20,000 of that, um, but that's still, I still have more debt than I did when I 
started the project. So um, it's tough. It is very tough. But do not do what I do not do uh, what I did. Um, that said, I don't know that there was any way to do it but for me to live on credit cards at the beginning. I don't. Yeah. I'm not sure what else I would have done. Maybe taking a loan from family. But honestly, I'd rather just be in debt myself than to borrow the money from you know my mom or my uncle or something. I'd like to uh, mention something about paying yourself. Um, when I first started, I didn't pay myself at all. I just was paying some expenses and things, and then uh, and then had a rude awakening when when my sister uh, my sister got sick. And my sister worked founded a nonprofit and didn't pay herself for six seven years, something like that. She had some resources, but but she uh, she didn't pay herself. And then in the last May, she was diagnosed with a terminal cancer. And she couldn't qualify for any um, assistance because she hadn't been, she didn't have enough work quarters in. Um, so she couldn't get disability, even though she had a, an automatic terminal diagnosis. So you never like to think that something like that might happen to you, but it's important to have those work quarters because of those unexpected things that take you by surprise. It was a real shock to her because she had spent years making six figures and all of a sudden she had nothing in the system. Wow. So just something to, to keep in mind when you're thinking about paying yourself, even if it's not a lot, pay yourself something so you're still in that system. Thank you for sharing that. That's really important. Um, so the last area I want to hit on, and we still have time for more questions. Um, we are journalists. That's where we started out. Um, but when you launch your own company, you have to know, you have to be a business person as well. Um, can you talk about some of the ways you were able? I mean, the best training is on the job training. That's what I got. But <laughs> but I know there are some programs and resources out there for to help us be, be better business people as well. So uh, yeah, I felt like I was when we started this thing. I was like very like allergic to like you said asking people for money, all of this stuff. And I'm I feel a lot differently about that now, in part because like you live through a couple of fires and like you you live through like the the trial of it, and um, that part of the work becomes increasingly interesting to me. Um, and the con the content like we have amazing people doing great editorial work, and that like. It is my job to make sure that they shine and can do their work, and um, like that means I need to be better at the business. So I'm I'm like actually super excited about that transition in my career. In the beginning, it was tough. Uh, I read probably in two years. I read like I had never read a business book before in my life because I think most of them are hot garbage and they're really not interesting to read. They could be they don't need to be books. They need to be like blog posts, and then people stretch them into whatever. So, but I read a boatload of business books. Um, about all kinds of just different aspects of running the company, and I still do that. I try to read one a month. Um, you know, I read fewer of them than I did at the beginning. But there's that. I, I did a social entrepreneurship boot camp, um, which was super helpful for me because um, it helped me make sure that as we're building the business plan, the mission is at the center. Whether you're for profit or nonprofit, we are a mission-driven business, and um, it's really that's just critical to the work. Um, and there is a business like argument for the mission that we're on. Um, and I think that that's actually a strong selling point to people who are interested in investing in this kind of work anyway. Uh, and then the other thing that I think was super helpful, so look for those programs. If there's social entrepreneurship, anything in your city or around you, like try to go to it. I think that those people are kind of our people um, and they're really helpful in like framing up like your asks and your business plan, all that stuff. And then the last thing would be, um, uh, so those, books, social entrepreneurship, and then the last thing was just like literal like asking everyone I know who had figured out how to start a business. Um, I just, I was really stupid about this stuff. I had no idea. And then there's like a million things when you start a business that come up that you're not expecting around taxes and like payroll and like all this garbage that suddenly you're like, I just wanted to make a cool website, man. Uh, and, and like that, and, and learning that stuff is really hard. So if you're not already doing networking with other people who are entrepreneurs, and I don't mean like, you know, there, there are varied returns on this kind of networking, but um, 
your chamber, those places are really important places for you to be, not just because they're going to help you like learn how to grow your business, but also for the advertiser opportunities or the fundraising opportunities that get presented there. So get in on your business community locally. Um, if, if for nothing else, for the good advice, I've gotten great tips from people um, at chamber meetings. Um, yeah, all, all of that. We um, we used a fiscal agent, so they handled a lot of the they handled all the donor letters that had to go out. They paid all our contributors. They were the ones that were to send the um, what are the tax forms that you get? The, not the 1099. So they're going to do all of that. Um, so what did they take? Out of so it was a seven percent um, admin fee for that. Um, I would have gladly paid more for them to actually handle the actual invoicing because I did that too. You know, we get the invoices from the contributors, and yeah, that was a pain. Um, I I would ask anybody. I mean, I'm a journalist, so I would ask anybody any question, right? So I didn't have any hesitation calling up the founder of some other place and saying, "So how did y'all do that? And how did you handle that? And I see you have this contract for freelancers. Can I just like borrow, borrow that? that? <laughs> like take y'all's name off, put my our name on it, and just." do that. Um, you know, the fiscal agent was really helpful. I wanted to, again, in the keeping of the spirit of the project, um, pay everybody within 30 days, anybody that's freelance. I've, it's taken me a year to get $300 for a book review that I wrote. It almost ended up being like, you know what, never mind, just don't worry about it. Um, so it took so much time. So it was really important to pay people quickly because um, you're working, you need your money. Um, so yeah, that Fiscal agent was was key. I would ask anybody anything, and also, you know, just to be honest, like as I would go through the project, I had a note on my, you know, the notes app on my computer, and I would just write down all the things I would do differently. So sometimes I would just have like a really bad day, and my list would, I got to do this differently, <laughs> this differently, and never hire this person again, and like just all this stuff. That was really, it's really helpful. And now, if this continues, I'm going to go back to that list and oh, correct yeah. for all those errors. I just want to like. Second that, and also you need founder therapy. Like you need to, you need to find other people. Yeah, like Tracy. And when I'm when I'm hitting the when I'm hitting the roof, like I know that I can call Tracy. Or there's just people in my network at this point who are on the same journey, and it's really, really, really important. You will burn out. Like you will burn out hard um, doing this work if you don't have like that support network. I think these two people make it look easy. There are some challenges when you are journalists and also running a business. Um, when you're going out selling sometimes, that can be a little awkward, a little yeah. sticky. So you might want to be aware of those kinds of um, those kinds of challenges as well. Um, I'm going to ask a question for someone in this room who's not yet asking a question. How do you build a team? Who should be your first hire? Um, our first hire was <laughs> Our first hire actually quit the job uh, six months in to go be on the show Big Brother. Um, so, yeah, uh, not a super, I mean, she was an amazing person, but we hired her actually to do editorial work. Um, I, we needed help on uh, social media stuff and on events, basically. Like, that was her job, um, was to come in and help us do that community management kind of stuff. People go around the, about this like a bunch of different ways. Our hire immediately after that was someone was an editorial leader for Miami, um, so that I would not be building the technology and writing the newsletter every day. Um, that was like just really like critical for us um, to get some, you know, to get some people doing the work that was core to the business um, that where we weren't doing all of it. Um, the other the other thing that we made pretty quickly was bookkeeping. Um, we made we. And we got a service first and then we hired someone on part-time to help us with that because uh, when you are tiny, you guys know this, if you're not paying your invoices, you don't have people who work for you for a long time, right? Like, And we're like you, we pay all of our contributors. We've never done anything unpaid that wasn't like an op-ed column, uh, but any actual reported journalism has been paid for everything we've done. And it means that we can't pay as much as maybe the big guys, although we're pretty competitive, but um, we will pay you faster. And so people would be more willing to work with us because of that. So bookkeeping help quickly to me was like critical for us. Um, I think the, the first, well, first hire, 
besides like just some freelancers that I had knew they were gonna work for me regularly with a, a managing editor. She took over um, working with the writers. I might have made the assignment, but then she would follow up and make it, you know, uh, land the plane. Um, she also did social media. And she didn't live in Memphis. She is, actually lives in Chicago, but she had Memphis ties. Um, she was amazing because she anticipated um, my needs. Mm -hmm. It was great. And I've been a newsroom manager for a while, so, um, and she'd been a newsroom manager for, as a, for a while, too. We, we just worked together wonderfully. Um, and so that was really important. <laughs> and I also had a um, visuals editor who was really connected to the kind of grassroots protest community in Memphis. And so she was like eyes and ears on the streets and had a lot of uh, good connections, could give us story ideas and report things, um, which meant I ended up doing a lot of the business, even though I started the projects I wanted to do with the journalism. So people told me, you're never going to be able to write if you're the founder. And I'm like, I'll show you. And they were right. I was wrong. It just doesn't, yeah. it doesn't work like that. Yeah, you, 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 have to think about, you have to think about, though, where your work is invaluable, right? Like... If you know, if you're a great journalist, you know a lot of other really great journalists who you can probably work with and who can help you do great journalism. But the business part of the stuff, is, I, I think for me, it was just like where we were lacking. So that was like where my work became more valuable. And, and in the earliest days, it was in building technology. That was where my work was valuable. And now I don't do that anymore because I'm not a great engineer. So we have an actual engineering team. So it's like figuring out like where your, your time is best spent. That's it. Uh, um, I, I found out rather quickly, it was hard for me to say the word at first, I found out quickly that I was the publisher and that the NPA was going to change that. And so I had to hire an editor. <laughs> I had to hire an editor, so that's what I did. So um, thank you, everybody. Um, did great. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Ryan. Great. 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 Great.